Uh, I'm Jacques Noor, Professor of Dentistry and Chair of the Department of Cardiology, Restorative Sciences and Endodontics at the University of Michigan. I'm also one of the Associate Editors for the Journal of Dental Research and President-Elect of the ADR. ADR will be hosting a series of webinars on topics related to COVID-19. Uh, visit idr.com slash COVID-19 webinar series for more information on future webinars. If you would like to receive continuing education credit for this webinar, you will need to attend the full duration of the webinar to receive the verification code to complete uh, the required survey. And be sure to register for the next webinar on August 5th uh, on uh, the basis, uh, the scientific basis for delivering oral health care during COVID-19, presented by Dr. Yang Feng Gren from the University of Rochester Medical Center, New York. We have a couple of more housekeeping issues to address before we get started. If you have any technical difficulties while viewing this uh, webinar, you can use the WebEx chat window and message IADR Global Headquarters. To access the chat window, hover over the bottom of the video window and press the speech bubble icon. If you are unable to access the chat window within WebEx, you can go to IADR.org and use the pop-up chat window uh, in the bottom right corner, a note you need assistance uh, with today's webinar. If you do so, IDR staff will be able to direct your question and assist you. The WebEx chat window is also how we encourage you to ask questions for the question and answer portion of today's presentation. Please ensure that all panelists option is selected in the drop-down menu when you, when you, uh, 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 make your question when you when you use the chat window to make your question. You are able to submit questions at any point uh, during the presentation, but they will not be addressed until the end of the presentation uh, in the last portion of the webinar. So, speaking today is uh, Professor Juan uh, Juan Bian. Professor Bian is the dean and a professor of the school and hospital of stomatology at Wuhan University, China. Professor Bian has been the executive director of the IDR Chinese division since 2009. He served as a member of the IDR board of directors from 2015 through 2018. And he is the vice president of the Chinese Stomatological Association. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Bian in person while I was visiting his school last November. He has done a phenomenal job as the dean of a truly superb dental school in Wuhan. So today's presentation is the research response to a paper published in JDR by, by Professor Bian and colleagues that is entitled Coronavirus Disease 2019, Emerging and Future Challenges for dental and oral medicine. This article has been downloaded over 294,000 times and boasts an uh, altmetric alt score of 382, which is the, just absolutely uh, amazing numbers. Dr. Bian, uh, we are truly excited for your presentation today, and I want to extend our warm welcome to you. With you, Dr. Bian. Dear colleagues from the ADR, IDR, I'm Zhuang Bian from uh, Wuhan University of China. Welcome and thank you to give me this chance to share our experience. Thank you. Today I will share our experience and uh, some questions raised from the experience with my colleagues. I'm Zhuang Bian from Wuhan. Wuhan is a max city located in central China with a population of 14 million. And I came from the school and the hospital of stomatology, Wuhan University. And we have about 1,100 1, staff and more than 800 students. 
and the last year we have 900,000 patient visits in our hospital to provide better oral care service in the community our hospital here is our headquarter is over here and we also opened many 15 actually satellite clinic all over Wuhan city this bubble is our clinical satellite since the December 12th last year the first patient was hospitalized and later diagnosed as COVID-19 as of July 26 we have 80,000 confirmed cases in China and 50 million cases outside of China the coronavirus infection of human is not strange since 1960s from the isolated cases from the mild flu-like cases we have isolated the coronavirus infection but in the past 20 years we have three pandemic that coronavirus have, uh, infected people when a person infected generally five or six days later will showing symptom that is called the incubation period but some patient can be as long as 14 days with fatality of the COVID-19 is 4.4% however as the patient age increasing the fatality will increasing most of the COVID-19 patients showed mild symptoms only a few uh, about more than about 14 percent showed severe manifestation only a few showed critical and those people often combined with commodities in hospitalized patients like hypertension diabetes or cardiovascular diseases for unknown reason children with COVID-19 generally have a mild system after we get infected the as early as five days IgM antibody appears in our appears in our body after infected the IgM will show as early as five days and can maintain for two or three weeks of illness and this feature give us indicate that a recent exposure to the virus and now we use IgM as early diagnostic the after infection of 14 days later IgG may appear so may uh, persist for seven weeks so that is uh, indicate a uh, infection history so most the infection comes from the symptomatic patient but some asymptomatic patient are actually a pre-symptomatic stage it's not a true asymptomatic about there is a meta-analysis indicate that about 15 percent of patients are asymptomatic because pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic patients are infectious that for some research believe makes the pandemic worse and the live leaf virus can be cultured from the stool of some patient but the proportion of such patient is not known so so far uh, there is no evidence support the fecal oral transmission but another question is still there that the risk of aerosol containing SARS coronavirus 2 generated by flushing toilet is not known 
the virus sharing, according to a research, the highest is on the day of symptoms. And then according to that result, a model was established and estimated the virus sharing, the highest point may be the day before symptoms. So the most infectious risk occurred on the period of a symptom two days ago of symptom to the two days later. So this period of time is most a uh, risk of infection. And the research estimated about 44% of secondary cases were estimated to be infected during the index cases pre-symptomatic stage. However, there are also some studies find that the viral culture are often negative after the symptom eight days. So even some research recommended that isolation of patient ten days later of the symptom can be lifted. And there is there is a publication on the contamination of the patient's room. And then they sampled uh, from the, the, the bed rail to the floor or to the window or the desk or the toilets. And then they find a very strong positive uh, here and the positive everywhere in this room, including toilet room. But if appropriate cleaning, sterilizing, there is a negative in this, for example, ante rooms. Also, a similar study checked the contamination of the high of the high touch area, and they find that the highest contaminated areas: flu, bed rail, electric switch, are contaminated by the virus. And the interesting is that the air exhaust vent also is very high. The detection is very high. And then when they stratify, they find that when the patient within the seven days of symptom onset, the contamination is the highest. Then it's much higher than that the patient is on the more than seven days on the illness. So within the seven days, uh, the virus shielding and the viral load again proved to be high. And the SARS coronavirus 2 has been identified in various secretions in respiratory secretion, gastrointestinal tract, mixed saliva, urine, and the stool. And for clinical diagnosis, the, the sampling place, the sampling uh, where the sample comes from is very important. For example, the highest de detection found on um, bronchial alveolar leverage fluid. And the second is butam. And then second, the narrow pharyngeal swab. And the least is throat swab. Although there are some reports that saliva could be an alternative for, for the diagnostic. However, the, the validation for that, we need more research. Although in, uh, the saliva as sampling would be safer, we don't need so much PPE. And the root of the SARS coronavirus 2 transmission, so far research found that the most often identified root is face to face respiratory droplets. This explains maybe 90% of the cases. And then the contact surface transmission, that means people contact the virus contaminated the surface and then get infected. This cannot 
This is possible. This is possible. And then one question is that the exposure to high concentration contaminated aerosol in a relatively close space for a long time, what is that risk? So, so far we try to avoid this kind of circumstance. So we need to always recommend this natural ventilation of a room. But we did not know, we have no that risk. So the question, especially in our dentistry, we would li like to ask if the SARS coronavirus 2 transmitted through aerosols. So I don't know the aerosol, I ask for some experts. The aerosol is a suspension of fine solid partic particles. When the particles are uh, smaller, the suspension in the air for longer time. And the droplet is a small column of liquid, normally expelled during face-to-face -face exposure. So there is no size cutoff. What is the droplet? What is the aerosol? But the aerosol it tend to be smaller and can be suspended in the air for a longer time. And there is a study. This is a, only an in vitro study that they find the, the coronavirus 2 can keep alive in aerosol they produced the aerosol keep viable for three hours with a half time 1.2 hours. And if the coronavirus 2 contaminated different kind of surface like a stainless steel, plastic, copper, and the copper board, they can keep for days. Only on copper is less, the other almost one day or even three days with a different half times. So the formity contaminated with the virus, we have to carefully handle with. And the concentration of the SARS coronavirus 2 RNA in the aerosol in one study was detected in uh, isolation wards, even though that is very low concentration. But it is higher in the toilet area by the use of the patients. And in another report also detected the different size of the aerosol on the large size in, in, in all the rooms, of the hospital rooms. Of course, on this report, the, they did not find the, uh, the virus in particle less than one microliter. These two research using uh, RNA, uh, RT-PCR method, uh, not culture method have been used. Therefore, we are not sure that virus is viable in the aerosols. So, so far we don't have evidence to show the infectivity of the virus detected in this hospital area, the aerosols, in the aerosol form. But in our dentistry, the aerosol generated is uh, often we often will generate the, the, the aerosols. So we need to evaluate the situations. That is a very important question for us. As you all know, that the epidemic come as a sudden and the un in China, in January 20, the government announced that the COVID-19 can transmit it from human to human. This is a very important time point for us. And then on January 23, 
my city have locked down. And then on 27, the government deliver a regulations that only dental emergency treatment is allowed. So the routine dental service is shut down since January 27. So when the epidemic comes, we gradually but soon improve our personal protective measure at our universities. So before the pandemic, we doing we serve the patient in this way. But the next day, we're wearing a gown, a 95 mask uh, with a goggle or shells, and uh, we even provide a shoe cover. At that moment, we do know this is a new virus, a new disease, trans infectious disease. So what we can do is provide the best protection, if only available, if affordable. And the second is we improve our equipment. We construct an isolation clinic for those aerosol generating procedure for the patient who are suspected for COVID-19. And also we as, uh, uh, construct the isolate wards. At the same time, a formu formulation measures and rules for dental clinics. And this is one edition after another, or almost one week. Every week we have a new edition of the management. And this is recommended personal protective, that, that is PPE for, for our uh, uh, doctor and nurses. The, the principle is that we, we are more conservative and we provide best protection, uh, if available, if affordable. And also during our uh, emergency practice and service, we need to evaluate evaluate the patients and the companions and in these cases we are doing now even we are doing this now until now the evaluate the patient the pre-check triage and record the patient information is very important because they are pre-symptomatic patients if they are identified two or three days later that the patient who once visited our hospital have suffered COVID-19 and then will soon isolate the close contact to protect their family and the, 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 the doctor or nurse or close contact will isolate it or quarantine in a hotel. And at the same time, we evaluate our healthcare workers and if they are fever or related symptom, we give, give them pay leave. Uh, they don't have to work. And this uh, is our recommendation on the uh, detailed, like we always keep a natural air ventilations and we give a personal protection as I just mentioned. And the forehand technique is always, we pro won't provide it. And use rubber dam and high volume saliva ejector. And at that time we avoid the procedure of generating spatter or aerosols. And from this figure, we see this our patient number uh, before the, the, the pandemic. Uh, fortunately, we are going to have a spring festival at this point. So just before our spring festival, we shut down our city and we know there is a pandemic. And then the number of patients dropped down, but we keep providing emergency care during the old time. And during all the time, we have a lot of doctors and nurses involved in, in this work under the protection, uh, uh, the PPE protection. And there is no case reported that infected in our hospital. And later, we also investigated the, the uh, dental service, uh, emergency dental service provider, all in one city. Also, there was no case infected during dental emergency care.
in whole Wuhan in that pandemic. So the PPE is effective. Uh, the PPE, I have to say, the PPE and the, all the management is effective in preventing COVID-19. Since January 21, there was the first report 15 healthcare workers have been infected. So we are very, uh, we pay attention on that. Until February 25, there are more than three thousand. There were more than three thousand healthcare workers infected in China. And then we look our dental surface. We find that we are in a high risk of normal corneal infection because we are close contact between patient and our dental practitioners. And there was research find that prolonged exposure to a potential patient more than 15 minutes in a distance within six feet, that two meters, would be high risk. Of course, our, during our dental service, we more than 15 minutes. We are in much near distance. And we even have to operate in the oral cavity. So we even have aerosol generating procedures, and then we may have pathogenic microorganisms attached to various dental instruments we may touch. So the dental surface is in a high risk. We, we think. And then we recently have an investigation on oral health care worker with the COVID-19 infection in Wuhan. Through our searching, the uh, member of the Hubei Stomatological Association and the, the society and the various societies, we finally find 33 oral health care workers have been infected uh, during the January to March. And in this research, two are not willing to cooperate in, in uh, uh, investigation. So 31 was included. And uh, among them are 22 females, which is com uh, compromised 70%, and the nine males. And then among them, 19 dentists, 10 nurses, and two administrators. The age from from the, uh, 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 20 to 50, nine is the majority. If we look at the health worker, this is not dental health worker, but this whole health worker infection of by day, this is day, and we can see the peak is on the January 20, 21, and then gradually go down. This is health worker. And this is the population's infection of Wuhan cities. And then when the highest is 10,000. And in this region, and this is 2,000 2000 patients per day at this in January and early February. And the oral, oral health care worker infected in between the health worker and the routine populations and these regions and this uh, uh, dates is the most a uh, symptom showed in these times. And totally all these patients infected and the dashed are the doctor and the nurse that work once in the quarantine or fever clinic or in quarantine wards because the shortage of workforce so Many hospitals will recruit dental dentist or dental nurse to support quarantine wards. So these doctor nurse get infected there, and these doctor nurse get infected not in the dental off office. So uh, for our analysis, so we delete that. 
So the remain are those infected, not in the quarantine wards. They may be infected in, in, in life or may be infected in our dental office. Among them, 19 cases reported contact history. And the seven reported they have family member with COVID-19 symptom at least one day earlier than they do. So they may affect it from family or from life. But we finally find the three, two clusters of possible infection in dental office. And Dr. Six and Dr. 18 is a brother and a sister working in the same clinic as a doctor. This patient is six year, more than six years lady. And the Dr. 18 is a sister treat patient A, the end of the root canal treatment for four times. The last time is he treated patient A. And then at the same day, her brother talked to A for a long time without face mask. Because this is on January 17, we don't know there is such an epidemic. So the protection is very normal, or even no protections. And then this patient A passed away in February with apparently uh, 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 COVID-19 symptoms. Her family member believe he, she died uh, from the COVID-19. And then a few days later, after the contact, contacts, the, the doctor, uh, a sixth a symptom, showing symptoms, showing symptoms, and then confirmed by the, the uh, uh, PCR, and then passed away on, on February. And the sister, also about 10 days later, a symptom appears, appeared, and then confirmed the cases. But now she recovered and back to work. So, and we screening of six, more than 60 patients during this time. And another 65 patients are healthy without COVID-19. We find one, this lady, died with COVID-19. So, uh, you see, it is possible the patient A is an index patient cases, infected Dr. 18 and Dr. 6 in this case. And in the second case, cluster, the Dr. 17 is a, dental doc, uh, is a dentist working in a general hospital the Department of Stomatology. And he has two patients, the patient B and the patient C. All his colleagues work as a doctor, but one is doing uh, endodontics, one is doing uh, implant, implant. And then on the same day, they are they treated by, by the Dr. 17, the two doctors have been checked by CT, and then they showed a symptom on the same day. So these two cases, these two patients have been confirmed later. And uh, Dr. 17, a dentist, about 10 days later, showed a symptom and confirmed. So from these two cluster, we think the dental office provider is in a high risk. Fortunately, the uh, Dr. 17's assistant did not get infected. He served for these two patients, but did not get infected. And uh, the, his assistant, we uh, checked his uh, 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 nucleoside testing and also the serology, and they show IgM, Ig is negative. A Wuhan 
experience a lockdown and a lift. On the, I just mentioned on January 23, Wuhan city is locked down. And then we stop our dental service on January 27. And then roughly on uh, 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 March 18, the Wuhan city, there was no cases increasing for per, per day. And then we end lockdown, lift lockdown on April 8th. And the government asked us to resume our routine dental service on April 18. So since then, we resumed our work. But our doctor and nurses are a little bit nervous about it. The psychological impact is obvious. So we think the best psychological comfort comes from the best protection. So our management for the resumed work is patient pass in this way, our staff entrance in another way. And this is a clean zone. Our doctor, and sometimes in this way, or this way. So this clean zone that our, our staff will come in and rest in here and take a PPE here. And while entering the working zone, they cannot come back. And they work in the working zone. And this is another building. And the patient come in this way and our, our staff come in another way. And the patient we are entering will have to register and the, the temperature and the epidemiological uh, recording and then they can come in to the, for the treatment. Our doctor after, our staff after the working, working, the working zone, they have to go to buffer zone to take off the PPE and wash their hand here and then they can free go home or lunch. And this is, we have even uh, some people, the monitoring people, monitoring our staff to take off PPE and wash hands. And the, another build, the, in another building, we have two other central buffer zones. As I mentioned, we have satellite clinics. This is a big one, about 20 chairs. And normally the patient come here both. And in this time when we resume our work, the patient come in this way. And this elevator only for our staff. And then our, our staff take PPE, come into the working zone. After work and the buffer zone and take off PPE and thoroughly wash the hands and then back to clean zone for lunch or go home. And this is a smaller one. A, a, a smaller satellite clinics and this is a fire access normally used but this time we use a staff pass and the patient go in this way and then this is seven chairs in this originally but now we only use five chairs this five chairs can be used and then the the doctor come here working in the working zone and the buffer zone take off PPE and back to the clean zone and this normally you look, uh, this is uh, the patient come in and uh, normally this is uh, a fire access. From the fire access, we doctors and the staff go in. And this in the triage in the door and the doctor is working in this way. Anyhow, our uh, uh, staff uh, still feel psychological impact during the pandemic. Uh, during our emergency care, we have classified our diagnosis. For example, the, we find that the popitis and the apical periodontitis constitute almost 40% of all the emergency diagnosis. However, only 6.4 they have root canal treatment. Normally, this diagnosis follow this root canal treatment. So we can see from our emergency care that our medical staff will avoid any uh, 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 aerosol ge generating procedures such as high-speed handpiece use. And then from if we look at it here, uh, uh, this is the number of our patient visits. 
and the, the orange one is representing the international classification of diseases. Actually, this is operations, different kind of different the kind of operations, and we charge the patient according to our operation. And you look from this where there is no patient, and then if there is a patient, only one third of pa uh, patient will have. Uh, the operation on them. A uh, doctor reluctant to provide operations. And then until the middle of the May, that means we resume our work one month later, then the operation will constitute about more than 60% of the patient. So from this figure, we can see the psychological impact and the recovery from that. And also, this is in one of our department, the cardiology and the dentology. The high-speed handpiece is often used in this department. And we have a make a record every day on how many uh, high-speed handpieces be used. You can see from the March, there is almost no handpiece use. And then from from uh, 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 April 18, we resume the back to work, and gradually we can until the uh, uh, June. And then our medical staff were willing to using the high speed handpiece now. So from here, uh, uh, we I think we need to pay attention to the psychological impact of our stuff. And we, during our practice, we raise some questions. And we often use the uh, uh, antimicrobial mouth rinse pre-operations. We ask patients to rinse their mouth. We think that it can make a dilution effect, reduce the number of microbes in the oral cavities. But we are not sure there is any anti-virus infection over there. So far, I think we need a kind of mouth rinse that can inactivate SARS coronavirus 2. And then, of course, this mouth rinse will only be used on chair, not for routine home use. And also, for our rapid resume to work, we need a reliable rapid diagnostic. That means the point of care for asymptomatic patients where we can make a diagnosis. So far, some hospital in Wuhan have asked the patient to do the nuclear acid testing, but that for one day long. So the next day, we can have a result. Some hospital will ask a patient to do the IgM testing. In that case, about two or three hours, we can have result. So if we can, if we can have a, a, a testing that less than one hour, that will be very helpful for our profession. And the second question is that we need anti-backflow uh, equipment. So some, uh, 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 some you see that uh, they have a backflow, so the color come back. So if uh, we, we feel that if we have the uh, special design to prevent this, to control the virus, to keep in the in the line, in the pipe. And also, the as we know, COVID-19 patients, when they with underlying comorbidities such as diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, will normally uh, tend to be severe or even a critical case. At the same time, the chronic periodontitis also associated with this kind of diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So we have a, a, a naive, maybe naive hypothesis that its periodontal status could be a potential prognostic index for COVID-19. So this is very interesting, very interesting questions. We are now in China here. 
our dentist is very difficult to access to the patients. So I think this is, uh, uh, we are very interesting, would like to look at it. And since the SARS have the sequela, like uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, long, long function abnormalities, and uh, we are not know what is the COVID-19 sequela, especially is there any sequela related with oral and maxillofacial component, such as saliva, glands, uh, dysfunction? We don't know. We need to, uh, in the future, to look at that. And also, we have challenges in research on the COVID-19. First, in China, the sampling and transfer of that sample only can be done by the designated agency. We, as a dental hospital, was not allowed uh, to do that job. And the viral nuclear acid detection also can only be done on the P2 laboratory. So our laboratory cannot do this kind of experiment. And uh, the viral culture and the related experiment can be only done in the P3 and the 4 laboratory, which is more uh, 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 higher requirements for that. So, so far, there were several dental research involved in the uh, COVID-19 research uh, in China. Uh, most of them are work in the Department of Stomatology in the general hospital. They have collaboration with other departments and then they get access to the patient, and then and then they can have to do some research. So so far, this also is we want to do something, but uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, limitations or restrictions for us. For our clinical demands, and during this pandemic, we are so needed for artificial intelligence incorporated in our uh, practice, such as robots for implant, for tooth preparation, and endodontic treatment. Also, uh, during the pandemic, we provide the medical consultations. We, uh, uh, in a short time, provide more than, more than 5,000 patients the, the uh, uh, consultations, which is, was very helpful. We need to develop a more technique and, and uh, to help our patients online. And at the same time, we provide the education. Our students still not come back to our university. They may come back on uh, September, this September. And then during this time, we provide remote education, remote examinations even. But we lack preclinical and clinical training. And this is uh, online virtual operation system or re robot patient simulation system is necessary in the future. Uh, these people contribute to my PP, PPT and uh, uh, the experience. Thank you. So I, I was saying before that I, I, I we really thank you for this uh, really uh, wonderful presentation and and for sharing with us your experiences and your wisdom uh, at uh, Wuhan um, with us. Um, I, I so, got a question just now. I got a question. Do okay. you still have that question? So so I had a question for you, and then we have a a, a couple of questions here in the chat. My my question to you was, um, what's the time between each patient that is treated with aerosol in the dental school clinics? So after you treated a patient in a chair with aerosol, how long do you wait until the next patient is seen in that same chair? Okay, thank you. We are we are now arranged that uh, every other chair uh, for uh, for patient. So not clustering together, uh -huh. and uh, sometimes 
uh, one patient one room, but sometimes two patients uh, share one room, but in every other chair. So uh, we're using the natural ventilation always. Uh, uh, um, before we have some room are closed, so we we take off that windows, the glass take away, so make it natural ventilation. Uh -huh. And then we don't wait, we don't wait. So we, we treat patients one after another without wait now. Okay, oh, terrific, uh, thank you. So we have another question here from Luciana. Uh, what kind of mouth rinse pre-operatory did you use? Did uh, we use the uh, chlorhexine, 0.5% chlorhexine as a uh, mouth rinse before the operation. Okay, uh, there's another question from uh, Dr. Matt Hopcraft. Uh, the the key challenge for dentistry is understanding risk of transmission from dental aerosols. Do do we have enough information about the viral load in saliva and the risk of transmission? Oh, this, this is a very good question. And uh, uh, so far, several studies are trying to understand the virus in the saliva. Uh, but so far, these publications we see is mixed saliva. And the, the, uh, one of the research, uh, they find that the virus in three or four critical ill patients, a while, they still uh, mix the saliva, they just uh, massage the uh, 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 sublingual uh, salivary glands, and then they take the, the secretion of the saliva. But it's not isolated. Uh, maybe there are still some mix with the whole saliva. Uh, that is the, that is the one we we did not find any uh, paper that related this with really uh, collect the saliva from uh, from the duct mm -hmm. from the unpolluted. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, this virus load in the saliva so far is not high, and sometimes it's absent. Thank you. Okay, um, excellent. Um, there is uh, one more question here. Um, uh, are there any examples of minimally invasive procedures developed as a result of COVID? So I, 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 if I understand this correctly, are there uh, new, new dental procedures that uh, were uh, are more like less invasive to the patient that uh, have been developed uh, uh, in your school or that you have knowledge of uh, in as a consequence of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, in the early stage of the epidemic in Wuhan, and uh, uh, because the fear of the aerosol uh, containing the virus, so. Uh, most of the doctor, when we have a, a patient, they were using a, 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 like art technique, using hand instruments to mm -hmm. do some uh, 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 operations. For example, when we have some patients, uh, we have opitis uh, resulting from the deep caries. So our doctor will try to use hand instruments mm -hmm. to to to. Uh, um, do the operations. So that's a kind of minimum invasive method that I, as, as far as I understand. Okay, thank you. There's uh, uh, just two more questions uh, because we are kind of running out of time now, but uh, one uh, is kind of a follow-up to this question, Dr. Bian, and the question is, is the use of silver diamine fluoride, SDF, increasing to help arrest caries in the context now of this uh, pandemic? I'm sorry, you, you pardon me? It's, so the, the question is if, uh, if uh, 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 colleagues, dentists are using more uh, silver diamine fluoride, um, uh, that, uh, that material that uh, is painted to the tooth the structure that makes the dentin uh, darker and that arrests carry. 
So uh, the question is, is the use of silver diamine fluoride increasing uh, in your experience uh, to help arrest caries? So far, I don't know. Uh, 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 I'm not sure we have this kind of uh, increasing this using of that material. Okay. okay. So one more question here. Uh, for the two clusters of potential transmission in the dental office settings, you assume that the direction of transmission was from the patient to the dentist. Is there any possibility that the direction of transmission was from the dentist to the patient? Oh, this is, yeah, thank you. This is a very good question. Um, we, we will look back. Uh, for example, we, we have two classes. One uh, uh, cluster is, uh, is that the, uh, 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 one patient infects two doctors. Mm -hmm. And in that uh, clinic, so we, they have 100 patients during that period of time. We, through telephone, contact 66 uh, uh, patients and find only one uh, is uh, suspected of COVID-19 and other 65 is healthy. And mm -hmm. of course, there are 30 uh, patients we did not find and uh, no response by telephone. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to find evidence that from our doctors are uh, infected to the, to the patient. So uh, we cannot deny that possibility. Uh, 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 but so far we have no evidence in Wuhan. Uh, it is very difficult to trace it. Okay, thank and you. Another, I'm sorry, uh, oh. I want to explain. In another, maybe I did not make it clear, in, in another cluster, uh, one, uh, two patients in fact, the, uh, one doctor, I don't know who, who is the uh, real infection. Uh, that too is a doctor, but it's not the uh, dentist. It's a doctor in the other department in the same general hospital. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we are going to, it's it's a couple of minutes after six o'clock. I think we are going to have to stop here. Um, uh, there's a, a few other questions. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, Chris Flo can forward them uh, to Dr. Bian and, 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 and have uh, Dr. Bian uh, perhaps answering them if, if possible uh, and communicate back to the uh, colleagues who made this question. Um, sure, yes. But, uh, but we, we really want to, we really want to thank again Dr. Bian for a, a terrific, terrific presentation. Um, and we want to remind you all uh, that in uh, next week on Wednesday, on August 5th, we are going to have the next uh, COVID webinar. Uh, Dr. Yang Fan Ren from the University of Rochester will be presenting. Thank you again, Dr. Bian. Uh, thank you all of you uh, uh, who attended this uh, uh, webinar. We hope that this was informative to you. Uh, and thank, uh, thank uh, all the folks at the IDR headquarters for helping uh, make this uh, webinar happen. Thank you. Thank you. More. Thank you. Let, uh, I, I'm glad that the, uh, uh, most of our colleagues are healthy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again.